Good morning. Welcome faculty and staff and the many friends and colleagues watching this live online here in Houston as well as across the country. My name is Steve Livingston. I'm the head of school at Houston Christian High School. Each year, our George and Barbara Bush Center for Scholars and Leaders host a distinguished speaker leadership series sponsored by friends and community members across Houston, including Sterling McCall Auto Group, Benchmark Epoxy, First Presbyterian Church, the Handel Family and Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church, Rock and Croc Attorneys at Law, and Houston's First Baptist Church and Grace Presbyterian Church. This year, we're privileged to have Jerry Mitchell join with us for this morning's professional development breakfast to be followed by an assembly with our student body and then private meetings with student leaders across the campus. Many years ago, I read Francis Collins's book, The Language of God. Collins led the Human Genome Project. He was a physician and geneticist, and he worked with scientists around the world for the sole purpose of mapping the entirety of the human gene. At the, his conclusion in 2003 was that scientists reported that all humans are 99.99% the same, which means the differences we see today among us, height, hair color, skin color, personality, only account for 0.01%. Over the next hour, we're gonna hear tragic stories of injustice committed during the civil rights era in the name of our differences. In several of these most prominent cases, it was Jerry Mitchell's investigative work as a journalist that brought justice and a semblance of closure and peace to the victims' families. If you've not purchased this award-winning book, Race Against Time, I would encourage you to do so. Jerry, I wanna thank you first of all, before we begin, for the work that you have done in these, on these tragic events in our nation's history. It is my prayer that these stories will enlighten our hearts and soften our minds for the work that we can do to bring about reconciliation. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you our MC, Dr. Darren Price, principal at Houston Christian High School, to lead these proceedings for the benefit of our faculty, staff, and those of you who are watching online. Dr. Price. Thank you, Dr. Livingston. Welcome to those of you joining us online as well as those in the room. We're excited that you can be here with us this morning. As part of our Bush Center Distinguished Speaker Series, we are excited to welcome Mr. Jerry Mitchell to Houston Christian High School. Our spe speaker series has been designed to give our community opportunities to hear and interact with leaders in their fields. Mr. Mitchell leads the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting and is an esteemed author. He has recently published Race Against Time, which Dr. Livingston mentioned, which outlines decades of work to achieve justice extending back to the civil rights era. I'm sure many of you have already received and read over his bio, so I will not restate all of that information. He has done tremendous work in investigative journalism that sets a high bar for others to follow. And the multiple awards that he has won over the, the last several years um, are just a testament to his work in the, in the field and in, in his career. We are blessed to have Mr. Mitchell with us. I am looking forward to hearing from him today, and I know you want to hear him and not me. So please welcome Mr. Mitchell to the stage. It's so great to be with you today. Um, it's the first time I ever did this on an iPad, so hopefully I don't punch, punch the game button. So anyway. Um, but uh, no, it's great to be with you. And actually, uh, I, I, I'm from Texas originally, uh, from the schizophrenic town of Texarkana. So anyway, uh, 
Uh, great to be back in Texas, and I got to have some Tex-Mex. I felt like I was at least back home a little bit, so it's great. Uh, um, you know, I, I don't know if you're like me, but if someone tells me I can't have something, I want it like a million times worse. Anybody, anybody else like that? We got a few people like that, yeah. So uh, there was something in Mississippi called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, which was a state segregationist spy agency. and to arm, where they'd send speakers up north, white and black, um, to go up north, and uh, they paid the black speakers and said, oh yeah, we love Mississippi, it's a great place, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, they had a spy arm where they infiltrated civil rights groups and that kind of stuff, and so they collected more than 132,000 pages of records on, I think it's more than 10,000 people uh, 200, more than 250 civil rights groups and others. And so, so when I came out of the scene, this is now 89, you know, I'd never heard of it and started learning about, but, but the thing that struck me and the reason I got interested in it was I found out that all those records had been sealed like for 50 years. The Mississippi legislature voted to seal them for 50 years. So when I found that out, my first thought was, well, there's got to be something in there, right? You know, <laughs> they wouldn't be sealing them for 50 years if it wasn't for that. And so that began my journey. Um, the uh, before I get into the details of that, I do want to talk a little bit about um, Meg Evers. Meg Evers was a field secretary for the NAACP uh, in these days. This scripture, I think, uh, kind of defines this life, which is, and what does the Lord require us but to love mercy, uh, well, to, uh, pardon me, but to do justice. He lived by in his life. And he was, uh, he fought in World War II. He actually fought in Normandy, and uh, was a part of the, the Nazis and came home and had to fight racism all over again in the form of Jim Crow that barred African Americans from restaurants, from restrooms, and of course, voting booths. And, um, he was actually a part of a campaign in the early 50s. Uh, they had bumper stickers that said, uh, don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom, and, and other things like that. And of course, he and his brother and other veterans tried to go vote and were turned away from white men with guns. And, uh, and so those are the things, and that's why he decided to become field secretary at the NAACP, and he investigated a a lot of different killings that took place. There was no justice. The killers just walked free. And this is, I just give you a sense of him as a family man. This is actually, I was talking to some, uh, I was talking earlier about. Uh, told the nation that grandsons of slaves were still not free. Meg Rivers was shot in the back in his own driveway. And his wife. Same time the state of Mississippi was prosecuting a guy named Byron Deal Beckwith for the murder of Meg Revers, this other arm of the state, the, the, the state. 
Uh, at the time my story ran, the odds were literally more than a million to one against the case ever being reopened or re-prosecuted. There was no murder weapon, no transcript. No, you know, I got the court file and there were like six pages or something. You know, it was just like nothing in the court file of any kind of value. But Merle Evers believed and she prayed and some amazing things happened. A couple months later, Jackson police are cleaning out a closet and have to find a box that contained the crime scene photographs of the killing of Meg Rivers, including the fingerprint of Byron D. Beckwith lifted from the murder weapon. A few months after that, Merle Evers shared with me her copy of the court transcript that she had saved in a safety deposit box. And a few months after that, and this is gonna sound like I'm making it up, the prosecutor found the murder weapon in his father-in-law's closet. So um, I went to interview Byron D. Beckwith. He lived in a place called Signal Mountain, Tennessee. You can probably guess how I found his house. <laughs> um, so uh, this is April of 1990. I went and interviewed him. This is, Signal Mountain's just outside of Chattanooga and way up the hill. And so I went there and we talked, talked for you know, like six hours or something like that. And of course he denied killing Mega Rivers and, but he's absolutely the most racist person I've ever spent serious time with. He was like inward this, inward that, and then he started in on all the other non-white races. Just read that section of my book. If you think you've met a racist, just read about Byron D. LeBeck with. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I just felt like I needed a bath after. Have you ever had a conversation with someone you feel like I need a, need, maybe need a bath after? And uh, so it was getting dark, and, and I thought it was a good time to go. And uh, so he insisted on, like, walking me out to the car. And I'm like, really? That, that's okay. Yeah, I think I can find my way. So he walked me out to the car anyway. He gets me out there and says, if you write positive things about white Caucasian Christians, God will bless you. If you write negative things about white Caucasian Christians, God will punish you. If God does not punish you directly, several individuals will do it for him. And so his wife had made me a sandwich. <laughs> I think you can guess what I did with the sandwich. So Byron D. Lebeckwith was indicted for the murder of Meg Rivers. He fought extradition from Tennessee, which, you know, that was a losing battle. And, and so he wound up back in Mississippi a little less than a year later. And at the time that I went and interviewed him, he had no idea that I was the one that wrote the story that got the case reopened. Remember, this is pre-internet, right? So he had no idea I wrote the story that got the case reopened. Uh, by now, he'd figured it out. <laughs> so he wound up back in a courtroom in Mississippi, and at some point he, he was talking to somebody, and he, he shouted out, he said, see that boy over there? When he dies, he's going to Africa. And I, I turned to a friend of mine and went, you know, always wanted to go to Africa. So Byron Neal Beckwith was convicted of the murder of Meg Rivers on February 5th, 1994, in the exact same courtroom we'd been tried 30 years earlier. And when the word guilty rang out, you could hear the waves of joy as they cascaded down the hall to the reach of foyer full of people, black and white, just erupted in cheers. And Merle Evers and her daughter, Rena, cheered as well. And I just felt chills because the impossible had suddenly become possible. And uh, this scripture has come to mind in this case and other cases, and I love this, this is one of my favorites. Because I did, after this case, I found myself diving into scripture. What does God say about justice? You know, what is his opinion about justice? And I know this is, I've seen this myself repeatedly, and it's so true. When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. I love that scripture. It really states the heart of God, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, not too long after Byron D. Lebeck was indicted, I met uh, this woman and her family. Her name is Ellie Damer. 
She's the widow of Vernon Damer. I doubt you've heard about this case, unless you read my, if you read my book, you read about it, but it's not a case that many people know about. But her husband, Vernon Damer, was a, a farmer, a businessman, uh, entrepreneur. He had a little grocery store. He had a sawmill. He had a planing mill. Had a lot of little things like that that he and his family did. And so, um, but the thing he was most, he, he was so dedicated to was voting rights. And the Klan didn't like that. And so the Klan attacked him and his family. Can you imagine this? You're sleeping in the middle of the night and your house is set on fire and you hear gunfire. And that's what happened to Vernon Damer and his family, January 10th, 1966. Um, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Vernon Damer and his family were attacked. Frigid night, very cold night. Uh, Vernon Damer, you know, heard the gunfire. They smelled the smoke. They woke up. Vernon Damer grabbed his shotgun. You know, he kept a whole stack of guns loaded by his bed for obvious reasons. For the, and so he grabbed his shotgun, ran to the front of the house, began firing back the Klansmen so that his family could escape safely out a back window. Unfortunately, the flames of the fire seared his lungs and he died later that day. A few weeks later in the mail came his voter registration card. He had fought his whole life for the right of all Americans to vote, but he had never been able to cast the ballot himself. Vernon Damer had four sons in the military at the time. In fact, six of his seven sons served a total of 78 years in our armed forces. And this to me is one of the most powerful pictures of the civil rights movement, and yet it's basically very few people know about it. And it was, it's this one. Uh, in fact, interestingly, a little bit of trivia about this photograph is it was actually taken by someone named Chris McNair, which that may not mean anything to you either. But if you've heard of the Birmingham church bombing and the four little girls, one of them was Denise McNair. It's her daddy took this photograph. Uh, this attack was ordered by this man, Sam Bowers, who's the head of the White Knights of the KKK in Mississippi, responsible for at least 10 killings in Mississippi, probably more. And um, so he ordered this attack on Vernon Damer and his family. Uh, so anyway, uh, I met with the Damer family after I met with them. He had the voice of prosecution Bowers had. He had never been convicted in the case. So I met with the Damer family that kind of told me this story. I didn't know anything about it. And after they met with me, they met with the district attorney. The district attorney reopened the case, acted interested, seemed to act interested, but got cold feet pretty quickly. And then it just kind of rocked on. He'd have this excuse, and then that got taken care of, and he had another excuse. You get the picture. It still looked like nothing was going to happen. Uh, so I ended up getting a, uh, a fellowship, or whatever you want to call it, to Ohio State to go to grad school and basically have my way paid. So I'd been, I'd been wanting to do that. So I ended up working out for uh, my family and I. So I was I'm literally in Ohio in the spring of 1997 when I got a telephone call from this guy who wouldn't identify himself but said he had information on the Vernon Damer case and wanted to meet with me. So I flew back to Mississippi, met with him, and it turned out that he uh, was a recovering gambling addict. And one of the 12 steps is to make amends for the bad stuff you've done in the past. He had worked for Sam Bowers. In fact, he had actually overheard Sam Bowers give the orders to kill Vernon Damer. So, he met with us, it was more than just me, it was uh, two sons of Vernon Damer and, and some others. And then um, 
and then met with the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office then, it was a new district attorney by this point, reopened the case in earnest. Um, the guy who had been the key witness back in the 1960s had been this guy. His name is Billy Roy Pitts. Billy Roy Pitts was involved in the killing of Vernon Damer, dropped his gun, got caught, plead guilty to murder, got a life sentence for that, plead guilty uh, to federal charges, got time for that. So a bunch of the, well, there weren't a lot of them, there were just a handful of guys, like three or four guys that got convicted in these cases, and it was almost a joke because, you know, the, the governor would pardon them or they would release, the governor would release them, commute their sentence or release them on work release. And so I was going through these guys trying to determine, you know, how much time did all these guys do, et cetera, that kind of thing, and it got to him. So I called the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Now, I hadn't been able to find a record of his state time, but what I've been told was he went into the Federal Witness Protection Program. So I'm talking to this archivist at the U.S. Bureau of Prisons in Washington, and she pulled this file, and I said, now how much time did he actually serve? And she said, uh, three and a half years, because he had a five-year sentence on the federal charge. And I said, okay, now, um, you know, uh, now I understand he left federal prison and went into the witness protection program, and the archivist said, that's impossible. I go, what are you talking about? So there was no witness protection program back then. So it, tur so it turned out Bill or Pitts had never served a single day of his life sentence in Mississippi. Kind of a big oversight, right, you know? You don't hear about that every day. So, um, so I didn't know if this guy was alive or dead or where he was, but I, uh, this is relatively early days of the internet, but I knew there was a website that I could get on and just type the name in and not have to have the city and state, because early days you had to have the city and state always. And so I typed it in and up it popped. Billy Roy Pitts at his address, Denham Springs, Louisiana, his telephone number. So I called him. First 20 minutes of the conversation went like this. How'd you find me? How'd you find me? I'm like, it's on the internet. <laughs> the internet, I got a list of telephone number. I'm like, well, I guess you have to take it up with them. So the result of my story that he had never served a single day of his life sentence, Mississippi authorities issued a warrant for his arrest. Um, he didn't like that. In fact, he ran, and so while he was on the run, he sent me this audio cassette, and when I got it, I played it, and this is how it began. Jerry, I just thought I'd let you know you've ruined my life. But I promise if I talk to anybody, I talk to you, so here's this tape, and on this tape, he proceeds to tell me all about his involvement in killing Vernon Damerell's involvement and also the Klan violence. So shortly after this, he turns himself into authorities, and this now leads to the arrest of Sam Bowers. Um, this is in May now of 1998. In addition to the arrest of Bowers, they also arrested his right-hand guy. His name is Devers Nix. And when the family brought Devers Nix in, it was like the most pitiful sight you've ever seen. They like wheeled him into the wheelchair with the oxygen tank and it's like, I can't take more than a couple steps without needing oxygen, Judge. Judge is like, well, I normally don't do this, but I'm going to let you out without bond. A dozen days later, this is like a reporter's dream. This is where we caught him. <laughs> so he got arrested. <laughs> yeah, he loved me. Uh, so fast forward now, Sam Bowers goes on trial, and guess who's there to testify on his behalf, but uh, Mr. Golfer. Anyway, uh, and so, um, so his lawyer is talking to him. He had a really good criminal defense lawyer back in the 1960s, but by now, the guy's in his 80s, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great, you know? But the reason for that detail will be apparent in a moment. Um, so he, his lawyer's like trying to talk to him about you know, strategy, you know, the, you, they're trying to work in a signaling system, you know, because you're, you, you know this, I mean, at this point from all the police shows and other shows that we all see, that uh, you can claim your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination at any point in time, even if you're on the witness stand. And so the lawyer's talking to him and says, uh, now Devers, when you get up there, if you need to take the Fifth, I'm gonna raise my hand. 
So Deborah's like, okay, okay. So Deborah gets up, he starts testifying. I looked over his lawyer about five minutes later. You can probably guess this part. You know what his lawyer was doing? <laughs> so Devers kept right on testifying. <laughs> yeah, I was in the Klan. <laughs> they tried to put a positive spin on it like there is one. Why, well, the Klan was a benevolent organization passing out fruit baskets to the needy at Christmas. And under cross-examination, the prosecutor was like, Mr. Nix, just how many fruit baskets did you pass out? And Deborah says, oh, sad to say, none. I swear it was the funniest trial I ever occurred in my life as a reporter. Deadly serious matter, but funny trial. Uh, Sam Byers was represented by this guy on the right. His name is Travis Buckley. And, um, and the thing you should know about Travis Buckley, he was not just a lawyer for the Klan. He was a leader in the Klan. <laughs> so, um, in fact, he actually got indicted for the Vernon Damer firebombing at one point. And so, there's a, anyway, Bill Roy Pitts is being questioned by the prosecutor, kind of laying out the case, of, you know, what'll happen. And he's going through all the details of it. And the prosecutor asked him who all was at this planning meeting that took place prior to the attack on Vernon Damer's family. He's like, I was there, Sam Bowers was there, Devers Nix was there, Travis Buckley was there, and no reaction from the defense lawyer at all, just none. And so the court reporter actually goes, what were those names again? <laughs> so it's like, he goes back through them, Billy Roy Pitts, Sam Bowers, Devers Nix, Travis Buckley, well now he shoots up like a rocket. Objection, your honor! Never covered a lot of trials in my life. I have to say it's the only trial ever covered where a witness implicated the defense lawyer himself in the case. Uh, but Sam Bowers was convicted August 21st, 1998, and sentenced to life in prison just like Beckwith. Um, the unfortunate part is that the hate that caused this, you know, hasn't really gone away. And uh, just five years ago, uh, we had this in, in, um, this attack on this church, and it, it, it just breaks your heart, doesn't it? You know, you had the nine beautiful people that were killed. Um, and the, the guy, interestingly, how it connects even up to this story, is the guy who went and who did this actually had gone on a website uh, that's it's called the Council of Conservative Citizens which connects up to this story this way, it's kind of the descendant of the White Citizens Council in Mississippi, which ended up being kind of a national group. Uh, so it's very fascinating. And then we had the attack in Pittsburgh that killed the 11 people at the synagogue there. And then El Paso, um, just down the road here, um, where the guy uh, went and killed 23, he killed 23 people and injured 23 others because he was try trying to stop the invasion, which is exactly what Sam Bauer said uh, to get his troops fired up. And of course, what happened with George Floyd and, and so many others, um, it just breaks your heart, doesn't it? Um, and it definitely connects. I mean, it's just a, um, a matter of how we view others, right? Uh, you know, is it a is it a, I, I'm the good guy and this person's the bad guy, you know, those kind of mentality things, are they the enemy? Um, when we start referring to other humans as monsters, you know, you really start giving people permission to do violence, right? Uh, as, as it's said, you know, before we, as we think of it as Christians, you know, um, before we, we kill, uh, with a weapon or something like that, we first kill right here, don't we? We kill with our minds. And that's why Jesus said himself, you know, if you hate someone, you're already guilty. And so it's a good lesson for us today. As for me personally, um, I've had people ask me about this, so I, I talk a little bit about it. I've had dozens of death threats People, you know, Klansmen tell me, had a picture of me and knew where I lived and 
all that kind of stuff. And, and yes, that was frightening, but it led to an unexpected gift, and that's the gift of living fearlessly. Living fearlessly is not about living without fear. It's about living beyond fear. Living fearlessly, it really, is about living for something greater than ourselves. And I think that's what you do right here at, at the Christian school here, Houston Christian School, is um, you're all about living for something greater than yourselves, which is great. To date, there have been 24 convictions in these cases, and it's a matter of faith in me, but I believe God's hand has been involved in these cases because there is no question that God loves justice. I, I put this scripture up on my computer at one point. I was getting discouraged, and I posted this scripture, and I love this scripture. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? What a great scripture. But the most amazing thing I've witnessed has not actually been the convictions. It's been some of the racial reconciliation. Not too long after Sam Bowers was convicted, uh, Billy Roy Pitts testified in a hearing. When he got done, he walked to the back of the courtroom and ran into Mrs. Damer. And Billy Roy Pitts apologized to Mrs. Damer and asked her to forgive him for killing her husband. And she forgave him. And she began to cry. He began to cry. And isn't that what it's all about? Forgiving. We have no business being forgiven. Isn't that what God does for us? I just am so humbled by this journey that God has let me go on, and I thank you so much for letting me come speak to you. Um, a couple of quick commercials. Um, one, there's my nonprofit. It's the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting, and um, we're trying our best to, uh, we believe that, you know, it's really impossible to have reconciliation until you have truth, isn't it? And so we want to be about truth. and. And also know that it helps to bring justice. And even if you can't have justice, you can have truth. And so that's what we're about. And there's my contact info if you need it. And uh, I, and I can, if you approach me later, I'll, I'll give it to you as well. But anyway, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitchell. We appreciate your words, appreciate you sharing your story. Uh, we want to transition now to a time for you to be able to ask questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier and gave you instructions, there's a mic here in the room, in the middle of the room. If you could please um, come to the mic, make sure you introduce yourself. That'd be great. Give us one second. We're going to transition and move this podium out of the way so you got, everyone can see a little better, and then we'll get started. All right, um, my name is Greg Ruth. I teach in the social studies department. Thank you very much for coming, Mr. Mitchell. Um, in your book, you talked a lot about the role the Clarion Ledger played um, in your investigative reporting. And I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts about um, the future of investigative journalism, given you know, consolidations amongst publishers and the effect that that has on longtime staff and uh, newspapers today. Sure, is it on? Yeah, there it is, okay. 
You're asking me about the kind of the history of the Clarion Ledger and that kind of stuff, yeah. Just how supportive papers have been in the past for investigative journalism oh, yeah. versus, versus yeah. today. Yeah, versus today. Yeah, well, at the, I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, I mean, the Clarion Ledger is one of the worst racist newspapers in the country. And that's kind of the irony of it, I guess. Um, and at the time that I was doing this reporting, uh, basically we had um, a lot of this reporting had a black editor. So it's, you know, a managing editor. Uh, Benny Ivory, and then and then later Ronnie Agnew. Um, so it's very interesting. So yeah, they were for the you know other than one editor, I, I was absolutely thousand percent supportive of everybody there in the paper. It was really interesting uh, that whole journey, and I've, I captured some of that in the book uh, about that. Um, but yeah, it was a you know, totally supportive of me, everybody. They gave me the time to pursue these cases, which is really unusual. I mean, here I was chasing, I was actually going around the country some, and so they were letting me do those kind of things. I actually went and did the Birmingham church bombing case too, which I didn't, I didn't really get into that one or the Mississippi burning case, but I didn't have time to go, go through all of them. But anyway, yeah, well, thanks for asking that. But we need journalism today, and I think that's why we started the nonprofit is, you know, uh, for-profit newsrooms are dying. You know, um, I hate to say that, but it's true. And so we started our nonprofit. The nonprofit model appears to be working in the news space. And so that's why we started it. And uh, because we feel like there, there needs to be more investigative reporting, not less, especially in Mississippi, where you just don't hardly have any investigative reporters left in the state. So we wanted to grow investigative reporting instead of just letting it you know, go away. Jerry, on that uh, note, go ahead and come forward. Uh, we'll get to the next question in a second. Uh, Jerry, just on that note, you know, you can write a book about the investigative reporting that's successful, but there's a lot of, I'm sure, frustration and failure. Yeah, there. yeah, absolutely. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, and, yeah, read the, uh, I've, I said, what, I'm trying to remember, it was the after, not the afterward, but I guess, uh, not the epilogue, maybe the epilogue, anyway. Nah, I can't remember. A acknowledgements, that's what it said. In the acknowledgements, if you read my acknowledgements, you tell you, I, I list all the cases that I didn't, I didn't, it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. Um, but other reporters have come in and, and done some great work too. So it's not just me. And uh, so yeah, yeah, you, 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 as anything in life, you usually fail more than you succeed. So yeah, absolutely. Good morning, uh, thank you for being here. My name is Ryan Klassen, I teach in the mathematics department. And uh, you mentioned in your book a, uh, a scenario or a conversation your wife and you had with your small children and going to meet these very dangerous people. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, a young husband and a new father. Uh, my daughter's just a little over a year old and I was wondering if you could tell me, uh, us a little bit about uh, the support you had from your spouse and or not su support from your spouse or um, how, yeah. you, how you navigated that. Yeah, well, I mean, God bless her. Uh, <laughs> you know, at the time, I, I, I had uh, no understanding at all. I was like, well, don't you understand? I have to go do this, you know. But I'm much more sympathetic now. I, I understand it far better now. Um, but at the time, I was headstrong and determined and all those things. But, I mean, God bless her. She was eight eight months pregnant when I went to go uh, interview Byron Deal of Beckwith. And, uh, and I, you know, the whole thing was a real roller coaster for me and my whole family. I mean, because, you know, you know, I'm like my kids, it's not that they, well, they did encounter racism over, you know, some of what I was doing, but it's, it's just interesting. You, and I'm sure all of you know this, you know, you start on some journey like this and you're kind of, whether you realize it or not, you're dragging your family with you <laughs> in that journey, whatever it is. And so that, that became the case there. And of course it, I remember coming home and telling her about some threat and uh, she was like, you call the FBI right now. It was like a Saturday night. I was like, they're not gonna be in, you call. So I called, they answered. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, it was, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, it, that she had to put up with, so, you know, 
I'm grateful. So it, yeah, she was. Uh, she and the whole family were supportive of me, and it was. A, it was like I said, it was a journey for the whole family. So. Hi, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Jill Skufka. I teach in the Bible department. So you put up Micah six eight, and that's a verse that we teach. Uh, we encourage kids to do justice. That it's an action verb. Uh, but they often feel a little overwhelmed by how much injustice there is, so they don't know where to start. Do you have any advice you can give on what sparked your interest in civil rights and how maybe we can help students find that spark themselves? Yeah, yeah, well, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think, you know, I kind of, um, well, I think it's always bothered me, injustice has always bothered me, um, and that kind of thing. And I, and I would hope it would bother all of us that you know when ju injustices take place that we we want to do something about that and not just sit around uh and and kind of be blind to these things so i guess you know my mom and dad taught me right about race from a young age and and so that i'm very grateful for that um and then you know uh this is deep in my faith i think this whole journey and i think that God loves justice, and so how can you not want justice when God loves justice? And it's a part of his very nature. And what else can I say about it? I mean, I, I didn't expect to go on this journey. You know, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer once got asked, why did you choose to get involved in the civil rights movement? Um, and she said, I didn't choose it, it chose me. And that's kind of the way I feel about it. And I think that's what you'll find is um, that God will choose you, if that makes sense, in these journeys. Jerry, if I can just if I can yeah, just add to that, um, you know, I I think when you look at something as big as the civil rights era, yeah. and just I mean, changing the status quo of yeah. uh, of societal values. I didn't I didn't think about it in those terms. I guess is a good way to well, think. It's, it seems so daunting. I mean, and you talk about having threats. Uh, there had to be some part of you that had hope that you could make a difference. Can, yeah. can you say, what, what gave you hope that you could actually change things that, that allowed well, you, I mean, because you don't, we don't just push against the wall if we don't think we're going to be able to make a difference. Well, I think what, the way I thought about it was, and I certainly do now, is God made the difference. It, it's, it's, look, this is bigger than all of us, so I, I don't, or any of us, uh, so the idea that or if you look today at, at um, racial attitudes in America and where, where, where we are and where we need to go, I mean, you could think of that as being incredibly dawning. But I think this is a good challenge for us um, as people of faith that we should take this challenge to heart and to try to mend and heal. I mean, I, I think that's what we're, we're called to reconcile. Uh, it, we're, we're part of the ministry of reconciliation. We ought to be about that. And I just feel very blessed to have, you know, been there when um, Bill Roy Pitts apologized and different things like that. I just feel very fortunate and uh, to have witnessed things like that, that that make you realize there is hope even, even in the midst of the darkness. Hello, sir. Uh, John Lister, Math Department. Uh, as I read the news every day, I don't, I'm pretty well convinced the world's not getting any better. And uh, could you briefly compare Mississippi then and Mississippi today? Uh, I need, I need Sorry, to... could you just repeat that question? Could you, could you uh, compare Mississippi then and as... Uh, oh, today? As today, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Mississippi in 1964, very few African Americans could vote. I mean, it was just, that's, they, they to go back in history, I, I explained this a little bit in the book, um, and Mississippi's history is not that different probably than Texas's in a sense, but you had the, you had the Civil War, and then you had kind of a little bit of a gap of time after the Civil War is over, and then what, what Reconstruction, and then what you had following Reconstruction especially 
uh, virulently in Mississippi and, and some other southern states too, including Texas, is uh, rebellion against Reconstruction. And so that's when uh, the 1890 Constitution was adopted in Mississippi that essentially disenfranchised African Americans, set up poll taxes, set up uh, constitutional quizzes. Uh, in other states, they, they would do either that or similar things to basically keep uh, black voters uh, from voting or people from even registering to vote. And so that's really what, what happened to disenfranchise African Americans. Um, that's also when, you know, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings in saying this, so <laughs> if I'm hurting someone's feelings, I, I'd apologize, but that's also when they started uh, erecting all the Confederate statues and everything, is, was in the wake of that. It was essentially, in their own words in Mississippi, their reassertion of white supremacy. And so that history continued on into the 50s, till the Civil Rights Movement, in uh, what we think of as the modern Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s. And, uh, and so, you know, you had segregation. I mean, I experienced it going to school here in Texas. Um, so you had all that, and that began to change uh, in the 50s and 60s, especially in the 60s. And so Mississippi's a very different place today. Uh, Mississippi's probably, in some ways, come further than almost any other state, but you have to look at where Mississippi was. And uh, so we still have a long ways to go. Um, but that, but we have more black elected officials than any other state today. So it, it's very fascinating to see that journey. Uh, but, but, the, but the political power, what's not happened is uh, the economic, economically there's still a lot of challenges. Uh, so those are the things that, that remain. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I'm Kelly Fox, I teach Spanish here. I'm actually a J school dropout myself, so I really admire people like you who continue to study journalism. Can you explain a little bit more about how you got started in journalism, specifically yeah. investigative journalism? How I got started in journalism? Yep, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I really got into journalism, well I got into journalism in high school. I started working on the high school paper. I was the editor of my high school paper. Um, I. Uh, I'll tell one story. I don't, I don't normally tell the story, but I, I, it's, it's a fun story to tell. I was a high school journalist in Texarkana, and, uh, and I went to my school, believe it or not, because they have Texas High, and, and I'll tell you about Texarkana, because it's half in Texas, half in Arkansas. Texas High, the high school is called Texas High, believe it or not, and so that's where I went. And, uh, and so, uh, so I, the name of the school newspaper was the Tiger Times, you know, hard hitting, hard hitting Tiger Times. And so Ronald Reagan came to my hometown in 1976. And so I'm a high school journalist. I'm like, I want to go cover. So I, I went and had my little, you know, press badge that said Tiger Times on it. <laughs> And so Ronald Reagan came, and he also came, by the way, with Jimmy Stewart, which was pretty cool. And uh, so they came uh, to Texarkana Airport and flew in, and I, I shook hands with him and Jimmy Stewart both. And uh, they came in, and then he kind of, after he spoke, he went around and talked to the crowd. And his little, you know, aide or whatever came around. And, and, and you got to understand, at this point, I, like, read three newspapers a day. Uh, you know, TV news, radio news. I mean, I was all over it, you know. And the little aide comes around and says, do you have a question for the governor? I said, well, yes, I do. <laughs> and so uh, they, they bring Reagan around, and, and, uh, and so he's like, I understand you have a question. I said, yes, I do, governor. And, and so I said, and I had just heard it on the radio coming in about the presence of Cuban troops in Angola. So I thought, what a great question. <laughs> so that's what I asked him. Governor, what do you think of the presence of Cuban troops in Angola? And he started to answer, well, uh, and I'm not making this up, the aide literally dragged him away from me. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm working for the Tiger Times. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody from president running for president is running. They're dragging him away. I don't know. I don't know if it was that encounter or not, but it was. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I, I loved journalism in high school. I did in college too, and um, really got into writing. I loved writing. I loved writing satire of all things at that moment in time, and. Um, and so I really envisioned myself as more of a writer when I got into journalism. But once I got into journalism, I discovered I was a much better reporter than I was a writer and really had to work on my writing. Um, so it's fascinating. You know, I just feel blessed by God and whatever reporting aspects are just God given, you know, I, I, for whatever reason. But I do think that. Um, if you desire to tell the truth, if you're curious, if you always have questions and those kinds of things, journalism, I still believe to this day, I know that we get, the press gets bashed a lot, and sometimes deservedly so. Um, but having said that, I, I believe that journalism is one of the world's most noble professions, because we're about truth, and there, there is, that's a great thing. And uh, so thanks for asking that. The Tiger Times question uh, inspired mine. My name is Travis Koch. I am the director for leadership here at Houston Christian. Well, great. Since uh, you, the aide pulled President Reagan away, or Governor Reagan. Yeah, away, was, it's funny. How, how have you seen media change? Yes, sir. In, in terms of being shaped, whether that's from the political field, being shaped from the commercial field. Uh, and even being oh, shaped yeah. with social media today. Yeah, well, boy, the internet and social media has changed everything. Um, you know, a lot of this reporting, I think that was one of the things I like about the book, a lot of the reporting was kind of pre-internet, you know. You know, I didn't necessarily rely on, on the internet to find the answers for a lot of things. So, uh, but yeah, social media has changed everything. I mean, you have a lot of reporters who are getting out and tweeting this and that, including their opinions on things. And, and I see a problem to that. I mean, you can, you know, you can, you can tweet certain things about facts, I think, but I think when you start realm, realming, you know, like this politician or that politician, I think you start getting into, um, at least in my opinion, yeah, I, I don't like for us to tread in that area. And it's just like, I think, this idea of reporters arguing with politicians. I think it's just a bad idea. We should remain respectful and professional. No matter how they treat us, we should remain professional. I think we should, that's what we should aspire to do. It's, it, but social media has made it increasingly difficult to do our jobs from a perspective of, you know, people are going to, take shots at us, and we've just got to remain professional. I mean, it's it's difficult, you know, people are name calling or, or different things like that. Um, that, you know, people are naturally going to want to retaliate or strike back or whatever. But it doesn't matter, it, 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 you know, no matter how high in office, if someone is calling you a name or calling you out or whatever they're saying about you, I just view our job as to remain professional. And I think the more that we as journalists can do that, the better off we are. Because social can also be a very valuable tool. You can, you know, I'm searching for something. I was, the other day I was trying to find an old Miss annual from, what was it, 1958 or something like that. I posted it on Facebook and I literally had a copy of it in five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, so it, so there are some val there is some real value to it. So, but the, but we need to take advantage of it while, on the other hand, not, you know, be uh, get 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 caught up in the maelstrom, for lack of a better word. Good morning. I'm Carol Bartles. I'm one of the counselors here. Um, kind of a follow-up on Travis's question a little bit. So with all of the, you know, we get so many different sources that bring in so many conflict, so much yes. conflicting information these days, right? Absolutely. Um, That's part of the problem. It, it is, for sure. 
if a student would ask, like, how do we, how do we begin to search for and find truth in the midst of all of these yeah, conflicting great... things? How would, how would you say, go for it? Be because I know that you've kind of had to do that. Like, here's yeah. the story, but what's the real story? So how do we help our students find that? Yeah, well, I think that's why it's important to have trusted uh, news sources. To these days, I think most people are close to all, or not all, but I'm talking about close to, if it's not more than 50%, I think it's, it, it's somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, of people get their news from like Facebook or social media. And the problem with that is, you know, you don't necessarily know where it comes from. You know, it, 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 and so it may not be a trusted source. So it may be some, you know, some candidate is running a sex ring in a pizza parlor or, you know, whatever the, whatever the allegation is. I don't know. I'm just picking that out randomly. But whatever the allegation is, um, and that's not to take sides one way or the other as an example. But what I mean is that's why we've got to, all of us, you want a trusted place you can get news from. And, you know, for example, locally, I, you know, I would hope the Houston newspaper is a good paper and, you know, a trustworthy place is a good example of a place you could go get. And AP, Associated Press stories generally are, are credible and, you know, checked. But the problem is when it's Joe Blow blog or, you know, such and such, you know, whatever, then, you know, are you getting opinion? Are you getting speculation? And that's the one thing, the proliferation of which I'm not a fan of, and this has nothing to do with political persuasion. It has to do with, well, this is what's happening, in my opinion. We are reverting back to where we were about 100 years ago or so. What I mean is, a little over 100 years ago, the newspapers would be like the such and such Democrat, the such and such Republican, the such and such whatever party, it would be party organs, right? And that's kind of what's happening now, in my opinion, is you're seeing that kind of on these TV channels. Uh, you know, the, the, it's not news, it's just people getting on and they're just kind of spouting whatever their opinions are about the events of the day or whatever. Well, fine and dandy, but that's not facts. You know, and that's what we need to deal with are our facts. So that's that's where I see the danger in that. And I think that's why we've got to go back to trusted news sources to get those. Uh, but it, but I have to tell you that the hyper partisanship that's going on right now has made it increasingly difficult. Uh, in terms of, I just see us kind of splintering as a as a nation. Unfortunately, you know that that. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats both think of each other as um, evil incarnate. And if you do that, I mean, you're, how do you come together? How do you agree on anything? How do you work anything out? That's what the, those are some of the dangers I see. And that's why I said trusted news sources are so important rather than I happen to see a story on Twitter and go, oh, wow, yeah, you know. And, I'm retweeting it or I'm sharing it with all my friends or whatever, rather than going back and really looking to see who's claiming that. Hi, good morning. My name is Angelica Torres. I work with the facilities department here. So during those times that you were doing the investigation for the, for the book and everything, how did you feel discriminated yourself and how did you work that, past that discrimination field and how do you keep your composure to talk to people like that knowing that, you know, everything that they have done? Discrimination, is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Sorry. I, I didn't quite, it's hard for us to hear the speech. Okay. Yeah, uh, just go ahead and take it off. It Thank you. My feelings. <laughs> So during the time that you were doing the interviews and everything, you were discriminating yourself because you were doing that. How do you work that discrimination on yourself? And uh, how do you co keep your composure to talk to people like that, that, you know, that they were doing that to you? Okay. Well, 
I mean, yeah, I think that's, a, I think as a quality, people have asked me sometimes what makes a, like, what makes a, a good journalist? And I think the answer I usually give, and it's certainly been true of my career, is persistence. You know, don't, never give up. And, um, and I think it's true of all careers, basically. You, you, it's that persistence. If you're just willing to not give up, but I have to give God credit for that because that's not, I don't know that I, I could have done any of it. Uh, I couldn't have without him. So, um, but I think that's what we need. We need to be persistent. You know, just because somebody tells you no doesn't mean uh, you have to drop it or something like that. You, if it's right it, and if it, you know, if it helps to bring justice, it's a good thing. So stay with it, keep fighting. Jerry, you haven't necessarily used these words, but in many ways you've talked about calling and you've talked about yeah. the, the noble profession of journalism and, and how that, how you've spent your life doing that. Calling is not something that just suddenly a switch flips. Uh, yeah. There's a process to that that I believe God takes us on. I agree. Can you speak to, to sure. maybe any pivotal, pivotal moments that really led you to really know this is your calling? Yeah, I... I this is, although this doesn't, won't have much of a religious, you know, connotation to it, I was actually working at a small paper in, um, in, uh, in Carthage, Texas, if y'all know where that is, uh, and so, uh, in fact, if you've ever seen the movie Bernie, it's about, it takes place in Carthage, Texas, but I used to work at that little newspaper, not very long, very briefly, and uh, I was working there, and the guy that was my editor was kind of burned out. He'd been a state house reporter, and he chain smoked Marlboros. And back in those days, there was no such thing as a non smoking newsroom, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my, anyway, my wife at the time was always saying, Are you smoking? I know you're smoking. I'm, no, I'm not smoking. <laughs> it's just the newsroom. Everybody's smoking in there. Um, but anyway, he's chain smoking Marlboros, and he's like, so what do you think you want to do in journalism? I'm like, I'm thinking about investigative reporting. And he goes, have you ever read All the President's Men? I was like, no, I, I've, I've seen the movie. He says, read the book <laughs> and study how they use attribution. Absolutely the best advice I ever got in journalism in my life. I, I read the book. And it kind of became my little Bible for investigative reporting, you know, learning how to do investigative reporting. And uh, so I learned from them, uh, Woodward and Bernstein. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, that ended up being a very important uh, thing. And I think, too, as I mentioned before, kind of talked about after I'd done, um, after Beck was convicted and after Bowers were convicted, I really dove back into scripture and just said, what does God think about justice? And what is, you know, what, and I, to be honest, I was, not that I was shocked, it's just that it, it just hadn't registered as deeply with me. And really came to the conclusion that justice is not just about what happens in a courtroom. It is about how we treat the least of these. And that's what it's all about. And that, that helped to drive me as well. So. Jerry, thank you for being here. Thank Steve, you. Steve Livingston, head of school. So as I read your book, it was very disheartening to see that in so many cases, the people that were involved with this were members of the church. I know it. And would you tell us a little bit about that and maybe how it impacted you as a believer, as well as, yeah. the, as well as the progress that you've seen, particularly in the area that you live, uh, with regard to the church and its relationship to these issues. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, that was horrifying. I remember going to interview, I, I, you know, I could have talked more about this, but when I went to interview Byron D. Lebeckwith, he's a part of what's called Christian identity, which is this horrible kind of racist, um, white supremacist, you know, belief. I'll tell it, in this, I'll tell it bluntly, very quickly, which is they believe Adam and Eve were white people. 
they believed that all the non-white races were created on the sixth day with the animals and therefore don't have souls. And they believed that Eve, um, had this is horrible, but this is what they believe, Eve had sex with Satan and that's where uh, Jews came from. So they believe Jews have satanic powers. I mean, I know this is all absurd and ridiculous and racist, but that they actually believe all this. And so what was fascinating, I guess, about in my conversation with Byron D. LeBeck with, um, is he started like, you know, telling me this and I would be like, like he said at one point, Meg Rivers was a mongrel and that God hates mongrels. And I was like, where is that in the Bible? <laughs> And so, um, only this group will get this. Um, <laughs> this kind of group will get it. And so, he had a Knaves Topical Bible. Everybody know what a Knaves Topical Bible is? You know what I'm talking about? Knaves Topical Bible is the one that has, like, you can look it up by subject, like faith, grace, you know, to pick your topic. <laughs> he had one of those, and he starts thumbing through it. And to myself, I am just laughing hysterically inside. <laughs> Because I know he's not going to find mongrel in, in Nay's topical Bible, you know. And, uh, but yeah, I was, it was horrible. I, I, and that, I think it outraged me, to be honest with you, the fact that people would use the name of Jesus uh, in hateful ways. And I think that's one thing I'd say about historically in this country that we as Christians have failed to stand up against um, the Klan and white supremacy in general uh, like we should have historically. And I would hope that the church would do that uh, continuing onward, that we've got to take a stand for what's right and how we, that God is no respecter of persons. And, and he's perfectly clear in that. And uh, in fact, I was just reading Revelation, you know, where it says, Every tribe, every nation, every language will all be there before the throne. So uh, it behooves us to shine that light, I think, on that purpose. And it certainly drove me in the sense of that these people were perverting what I felt like was um, the true gospel. Yeah. Good morning. Morning. My name is Marvita Stewart. I'm with Sterling McCall Auto Group. I commend you for your work. Thank you. I don't you. know that I would have had the, I don't know, my beats per minute escalate every time I watch your video. Um, and I do believe it's your calling, and only God could give you that. When I think about the individuals, I have to come forward. Medgar Evers was born 10 years before my father. I was born in 1960. Wow. I have a sister who was born in 67. Wow. To know that these things happened in my lifetime. I know exactly. It's still unnerving. Yeah. These people had children, just like the man that, you know, came forward in his wheelchair, and they have children. Exactly. How much influence buy-in do you think has happened? Because my concern is yeah. that thought process is alive and well today. But well, it's, it? It, it's never gone away. I mean, that's, the, that's the unfortunate part. And so do you see that in your People, life's work? You see it in kids, don't you? Mm. Don't you see kids? I mean, they don't, what is color with little kids? You know, I mean, they don't see that. Yeah. But go ahead. But I was going to ask you, what do you see in your life's work? Obviously, if it were all done, you wouldn't have to still have the effort that you're supporting. So I'm just curious as to what you see now as a result of what was ingrained in them. And thank you so much again. Well, I do see some hope, too. I mean, I, I know that I've talked to some of these clan you know, sons and grandsons and stuff like that. And not every one of them is necessarily exactly the same as, as dad or granddad. And so you start to see some hope that way. 
I certainly, with my own kids, um, you know, with their upbringing, you know, saw more hope, you know, in terms of than what I certainly encountered growing up and that kind of thing, uh, where there was a lot of prejudice. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to overcome, but I also think we've come a long ways, if that makes any sense. Like, we've come a long ways, but the events of the past year ought to make pretty clear to us that we also have a long ways to go uh, with George Floyd and these other things. As Like I said, as long as we see, it's, it's moving, the, the, what we've got to be able to do is move from otherness to us. I mean, that's really the key, isn't it? Because as long as I see people as others, then I may denigrate them or put them down or see them differently or less than in some way, regard them as monsters or, you know, whatever that language is, then that's where that's a problem. We've got to address that. We've got to address that kind of hate that persists. Uh, but the answer is obviously love and teaching. I mean, Jesus doesn't just call us to love. He calls us to love our enemies. You know, what was he thinking, you know? <laughs> you know, and, but that's what he did for us. If, you know, I think about that. Well, how in the world am I supposed to love my enemy? But then I see what Jesus and God loved us when we were enemies. Then I understand that. But we've got to do a better job. I think as a church, as a people, to uh, overcome those barriers. I think that's been part of the problem. Just my opinion now. I think part of the problem is that the reason we keep repeating our history is we don't know our history. And I can't tell you how many people who've read my book that I've gotten emails from or people who've talked to me said, especially uh, white Americans, I had no idea this happened. I had no idea. And, um, and, and I understand completely where they're coming from because that was me before I began this journey. And so I totally understand. Uh, I knew nothing. And our schools have got to teach this. We've got to start teaching this because to, to understand where we are today or what happened at the Capitol, you know, the other day. We have to understand our history. These things don't happen in vacuums. These are part of movements that have been going on a while. Uh, the Proud Boys and Q and all these things, they, they've been going on a while. This, they're, just, they're just descendants of things that have been going on a while. Um, so anyway, that's my opinion. Mrs. Creekmore, I think we've got time for one more question, please. Sorry, I've been, uh, I'm Diane Creekmore, English department. I've been creeping my way up from the back. Oh, you're doing great. Uh, We're not I, timing you, I promise. Okay. First, I'd like to thank you for your courage and your perseverance to keep following the truth. And that seems to be hard to do in society. And then I'd like to say in eight decades, I have lived so much of the stuff. You've brought up all this emotional stuff in me today because it was part of my growing up. Yeah. I grew up in segregated Houston, went to a segregated public high yep. school, knew no black people until through my involvement in my church, I got right. involved in something called the United Christian Youth Movement. And I went to several camps and the summers I was 16 and 17, I met a young man who was a preacher for kids at the camp. His name was Andrew Young. How about that? And you know who he is. I, I, I yeah, absolutely. And I remember that second summer he said that he was leaving his job and he was going to go work for uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Conference. which I'd never heard of. How and about that? And of course, that? Uh, he, he was one of the most influential people in my life, he That's broke great. the color barrier. And I'd grown up hearing all kinds of um, terrible language. Nobody, nobody thought it was bad to say something. If, if you were sympathetic to black people and you were white, you were a communist. Ex or exactly. Or some kind of a lover. You know? Or an inward lover or whatever. Yeah, 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 that yeah. thing. So I would just have to say 
that, you know, I went to camp, I sang, we shall overcome, and it has seemed like Groundhog Day yes. these last few years. And you know, you think that progress is being made. So there are a couple of points I guess I wanted to ask you to address, sure. and you've already addressed a lot of them. But I do think that people don't know their history. Yep. And that is part of the problem. They have yep. no idea. Um, and secondly, um, I think since I teach you that I, 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 the church is going to have to do something because um, young people, a lot of them, I think, think that Christianity is very hypocritical. Yeah. You say one thing and you act another. Right. And so I think the future of our church yeah. really has to, to work with this. And knowing, knowing the truth is such a big part of it. So, but, but I want to ask you, you know, how do you keep people from becoming discouraged? It's because you've worked a whole career and, yeah. you know, you've seen progress, but, it, you know, it's two steps forward, one step back, like you that's, said. That's race relations in this country, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So anyway, yeah. if you want to just kind of address that, what do we do with young people today? They, they have no idea of their history. Uh, they're seeing all these riots and horrible things, and people are saying things they shouldn't be saying in public all the time. What do you, what do, you do uh, as, as a reporter, as somebody who has, a, a, I guess, a, a public... Uh, I. Um, what more can be done? What, what, well, what, is your, what is your idea for the future? You know, I wish I could answer, uh, you, you know, I wish we could, yeah. I wish I had all great answers. I, I, I probably don't. I will throw this out, and this is my opinion as well. Um, I probably, you guys may hate me for this one, so, but just, I'll take the criticism with it. I think that we have let politics invade the church and I think it's a shame I'm not I'm not taking sides on any of that I what I mean is we've got to be very careful it's not that we can't be politically active I'm not saying that or even run for office I hope we have more godly people run for office but what I mean is we can't let partisanship trump our faith and that's what i unfortunately seen and on both sides I don't, I'm not I'm not restricting it to to one side so I that's my opinion I think that we've got to be very careful with that and the other thing is I definitely think the church needs to step up and and fill that void of as you talk uh, talked about um, we've got to do a better job of what we're doing of shining a light into the darkness uh, there's a lot of darkness out there and we've got to take our role and take it seriously. And in terms of encouragement, I recommend that verse. I, uh, I need to post it back up again. Uh, I'm the God, the Lord of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? You know, we, I was just, uh, audio Bible, I have an audio Bible, and I was just listening to Exodus, and, uh, or not Exodus, I guess it was Numbers. And uh, the people are hungry. You know, the Israelites are hungry. And uh, God said he's going to provide, you know, feed them all. And Moses, even Moses is going, well, where are you going to find food, to, you know, <laughs> to feed all those people? And then next thing you know, God brings in a bunch of quail, you know, more quail than they can even eat. And so, um, you know, and I, I got very discouraged in the middle of that Mississippi burning case because it just kind of rocked on a long time. And I put that scripture up on my on my computer as a reminder of just look. Do you realize <laughs> who he is and what he can do? And I think we just need to take advantage of that. And I think that is the real key. Yeah. Mr. Mitchell, thank you so much Thanks. for being with us Thanks. this morning. Thanks very much.
I got to say this. Whatever you do, give God the glory in this. Give God the glory for justice. Uh, I, it's not about me. It's about him. So thank you. Thank you very much. Our time is up this morning, um, and I think that's a great way to end. You know, God can do immeasurably, immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, Amen. and we definitely need him in the midst of this. Uh, thank you so much for your questions, uh, faculty and staff. I know that's one of the things we've been talking through as faculty is just looking at things from perspectives other than our own, seeing things from our students' perspective, looking at that those relationships, and trying to see the world sometimes through our students' eyes. And we have such an opportunity to influence and to, to change um, the views and the opportunities and experiences that our students have. And I hope this has been meaningful for you and will help you as you enter the classroom today. I know many of you are, are headed there right now. So have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. There are a few books.